We start with a point. Hi, everybody. It's Rob Bryanton again. Thank you for joining me here at the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog. Today's entry is called Holograms and Quanta. So, July 2006, this project was launched. Uh, here at the four year anniversary now, there's been about six million unique visitors to the 10thDimension.com website. And the original animation posted at Rever.com is now at uh, 1.4 million views and has climbed to within 30 of being that site's most watched video of all time. That same animation at YouTube is also uh, at about a million views. And googling the title of my book in quotes now, I did that a few months ago, and around two million separate references to my project came up there. Uh, I did a little screen grab of it just because I thought that was so amazing. So with all the chatter that's been out there, we have some naysayers who have proclaimed my project to be a scam, to be completely wrong, even to be dangerous. Some of those attacks have been downright vicious. What prompts such outrage? Part of it is a knee-jerk reaction. This is not what I learned in school, so it must be wrong. I guess the phrase, a new way of thinking about time and space, doesn't really mean anything to those people. Meanwhile, more and more people keep seeing ways that this approach to visualizing the dimensions can be aligned with their own understanding of reality, and that's why the audience for this project continues to grow. So this time around, let's talk about the person observing the waveform, as seen in the graphic we're showing here from my original animation, and look at some of the new theories and new discoveries that are gradually moving the mainstream towards my new way of thinking. Two important ideas are represented in this graphic. First of all, the idea that the quantum and the macro worlds are in some way completely separate and that there's a dividing line where we are either in one realm or the other is starting to fall by the wayside. Demonstrations of quantum entanglement and superposition with increasingly large molecules move us towards understanding that this is a continuum and research indicating that algal photosynthesis and even migratory birds' navigational abilities are using quantum effects argue against the old idea that our warm and wet macro world is completely separate from the quantum one. Advances are also continuing in quantum computing. Did you hear that Google is now demonstrating a quantum computing system that can recognize and sort individual images by their content? More and more, visualizing the underlying wave structure of our reality is essential to our understanding of what we're observing. Now, the second point represented here is the idea that there's something holographic about our reality, with the fifth dimension holding the many different possible states for our universe, and interference patterns causing one version or another to be observed at any particular instant is also going through a resurgence. In the 1970s, both Stephen Hawking and Jacob Bekenstein explored holographic approaches to cosmology. Michael Talbot's popular 1991 book, The Holographic Universe, created much excitement about the work of physicists David Bohm and Carl Pribram, both of whom had also independently come up with holographic models. But that excitement seems to be overshadowed as string theory and then M-theory became the dominant research models over the following years. Still, the idea didn't go away, with notable physicists like Juan Maldacena, Leonard Susskind, and Gerard Tehuft suggesting important holographic concepts during the 90s. In this blog, we've talked about a number of holographic universe theories that have been advanced in the last few years, and some of those models do incorporate quantum mechanics and string theory. In a blog entry uh, I published not long ago called More Slices of Reality, we mentioned an exciting new approach from string theorist Eric Verlinde of the University of Amsterdam, which explains gravity using a blend of string theory, quantum mechanics, holograms, and the key idea that when you look at the underlying structures of our universe, information equals reality. In the New Scientist article in Dr. Berlin's new approach, they sum it up like this. Like the fluidity of water, gravity is not ingrained in matter itself. It's an extra physical effect. To which I would add, if there are parts of the multiverse where gravity is stronger, then we could liken that part of the multiverse landscape to syrup rather than water. And perhaps we could liken low gravity regions to water vapor. One of the side effects of Dr. Verlin's approach would be to disprove the need for the theoretical graviton particle. And uh, there's a poll that I ran uh, not long ago at my blog which asked that idea. Will the graviton ever be observed? 
Now, if you read the New Scientist article I'm talking about here, you'll see the suggestion that with this new approach, gravity and thermodynamic entropy are related. Since there's more entropy in the future than the past, would that mean that gravity comes from the future? Again and again, I return to Einstein's proposal that the distinction between past, present, and future is ultimately meaningless. I think this article in Dr. Verlin's approach could have used a good dose of that timelessness in its analysis. Eventually, I believe, it'll be shown that gravity comes from both the past and the future simultaneously. That will prove to be related to the fifth dimensional probability space that we are navigating within, where the past is as fluid as the future. But some events are more likely than others to occur or to have occurred. Understanding that information equals reality requires us to think about the space where everything that can occur does occur simultaneously outside the constraints of our 4D space-time. This also requires us to understand that any events that are currently impossible for our own version of our universe must reside outside of our fifth dimensional probability space. Dr. Verlin's approach has attracted a lot of initial attention, although he cautions people to understand that this is not a fully developed theory yet, but is offered as a framework that should now be explored. This is something I've always said about my approach to visualizing the dimensions as well. I've offered it to the world as a framework for discussion, and a great many other people around the world have enjoyed playing with these ideas. Now we're going to talk a little more about the underlying ideas to my approach next time in Strength of Gravity, Speed of Light. That's all for now. My name is Rob Bryanton. Enjoy the journey.